in our uh, series on Jesus, our <laughs> indefinite series on Jesus. And uh, we're going to be in, in John chapter 1 again. Uh, we're going to touch on a couple other places. But uh, last week we started talking, we're, we're looking at the, the first, some of the first disciples to be called and to follow Jesus. And last week we looked actually at John the Baptist, because John the Baptist mentored and uh, pointed the way for the first, some of the first disciples of Jesus, for Andrew and John. And, and what we said last week is John found himself in a place where he'd spent his whole life learning about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and then pointing the way to Him. And yet, it did not necessarily lead him to the place that you might have expected it to go. It, his faithfulness did not necessarily mean everything worked out perfectly in his life. And he found himself in prison after speaking what he thought God wanted him to speak about the truth of the sin in the king's life. And ultimately, he'd find himself beheaded. But before that happened, he sent a message to Jesus. He said, hey, are you the one who was to come or should I expect someone else? This man who'd given his whole life to Jesus in a moment of difficulty had some doubts. He wanted to be sure that he'd invested in the right thing. And so we, we said, stick with Jesus wherever God leads you. Stick with Jesus wherever God... It's not necessarily that you're not going to have trouble, but... It, but he is the one, he is who he says he is. So stick with him. And that's, that's where we, we left off. And we said, whenever God calls, go. We said, invite whoever God has given you. Use whatever God has given you. Stick with Jesus wherever God leads you. Now, today, we're looking at first century, we're going to start by looking at first, central, first century Middle Eastern history. Yay! Does that sound exciting or what? And I, I, I need to, before I dig into that, I just need to say a lot, a lot of the, that information, in fact, almost all of it, is from this guy named Ray Vanderlaan. Guy who, he, his website used to be called Follow the Rabbi, and he recently changed it to That the World May Know. And you can go there, and you can read all kinds of stuff about the historical context of Scripture. And it just, you're going to see, it will blow your mind. It will change the way that you look at the Bible, because a lot of our preconceptions about the people in the Bible and the environment of the Bible, they're just not true. <laughs> and we'll get there. You're, you're going to see. But, but I just need to tell you, a lot of that information came from there, and you can look it up yourself if you want. Um, some of it, I think, is limited to a subscription service, uh, which, I, which I have, but you may not want to pay for. But there is plenty of free information on there as well. All right. So let's start with this. Israel. Israel is a long, vertical country on the Mediterranean Sea, okay? And it's broken into three parts. You can see there in this picture, the northern part is, is called Galilee. It's called Galilee. And then there's the central part, Samaria. And then there's the southern part, Judea. And Jesus and his disciples are from the region of Galilee. Okay? And, and Galilee is, is the Jewish education center where all the schools are located in, in Israel. That's, it's the center of religious and, and, uh, and uh, technical education right there in Galilee. But, but they're not schools like you would normally think about, okay? They didn't have school buildings. Rather, they were taught at the synagogues by Jewish rabbis called Torah teachers, okay? And the Torah, and Torah is made up of what amounts to the first five books of our Bibles, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? So boys and girls are actually separated in these schools, and they learn two different things. Boys, ages 6 to 12, were taught all kinds of practical skills from the Torah, okay? They were taught math and history and geography and language, all the technical stuff from the Torah. The Bible was their textbook, okay? And they learned technical skills, but the main goal for boys ages 6 to 12 was to memorize the Torah, word for word. If you have a Bible, take it and just pinch Genesis through Deuteronomy, Consider the size of that text and the number of words there, and then try and imagine being a six, seven, eight-year-old boy and your teacher saying, you're going to memorize this. Word for word. Memorize the Torah. Okay, so that's the primary goal for boys. Girls, on the other hand, they focused on a little bit, just a part of the Torah and then the Psalms and the Proverbs. They focused on Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Proverbs, which were taught to them to give them the practical skills to be homemakers. Proverbs 31 would have been 
kind of this central final admonishment for young ladies about managing their home to the glory of God. And in fact, we actually see in Jesus' interactions with Jewish women, he primarily quotes the Psalms because that's what they studied. So he, as a, and we'll talk about it in a minute, as a master teacher, always knows his audience, always knows what they know and how to bring the Scriptures to life, how to bring the truth about himself to life. Okay, so upon puberty, girls were given in marriage and they began married, married in family life around age 12. And they're done with school. No more. Boys, on the other hand, who had memorized the Torah, who had completed their schooling, passed the attests, are, are qualified to continue with their education and are eligible to go to Jerusalem to participate with their family in the Passover, the, the, the killing of the animal for the forgiveness of the family's sins. Okay, the Passover, if you've been with us on uh, Wednesday nights, we talked about recently. The blood of the lamb was painted on, painted on the doorposts of every home who put their faith and trust in God. And they were, they were forgiven. The death passed over them. They were given life. Okay, so let's, let's just real quick look at Luke chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. It says in Luke chapter 2, Every year, his parents, Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. The custom was taking their now 12-year-old boy who just passed his Torah exams to the Passover feast, and he can now help Joseph kill the lamb. He can help in the preparation of the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins for their family. Which means, and this is really important, we talked about this several weeks ago when we introduced our series on Jesus, this means that Jesus was just like every other Jewish boy in Galilee. Okay, He was fully human. He experienced life from the perspective of every other Jewish boy in Galilee. He went to school, he studied the Torah, he memorized it, he passed, he went with his family according to the custom, and participated in the feast. And now he can continue his education. So from age 12 to 15, Jesus and other Jewish boys like him were enrolled in what was called the Beth Midrash. And I, this is a picture of a modern uh, Jewish uh, classroom. But these men are much, these are men. They're old, much older than what the boys at the Beth Midrash would have been. These, we're talking 12 to 15 year old boys were enrolled in the Beth Midrash. And so for the next three years, they would continue learning the Torah. So they've memorized it, and now they're, now they're being asked to grow in their understanding of it, to begin to pick out the nuances and see the story of God weaving through the history of man. Okay? And, and, they would all, now they're going to also start bringing in the other parts of the Hebrew Scriptures, the, the prophets and the, the historical books. They're going to start studying these other parts. And in fact, it was going to be expected, if they were going to graduate to the final course of study, they were going to memorize the rest of what amounts to our Old Testament. 12 to 15 years old, they're going to memorize the Old Testament. Squeeze, pinch that part of your Bible and try and imagine that, okay? They're going to memorize it. And, the, and on top of that, on top of their schooling, okay, they're, now, they're not just going to school now because if they don't make it, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, they're going to do something else. And so now they're beginning to apprentice with their dads in the family business. So they go to school, right, and they work on memorizing the entire that's all the Bible there was at that time, right? They're, they're working on memorizing and understanding and knowing the entire Bible at that time. And then they're going home and they're helping dad clean out fishnets or sand off furniture, right? So they're, they're full-time, 15 hours a day, 16 hours a day, going to school and working in the family business, being trained. And depending on how they do in the former will determine where they go next. See, in first century Israel, you didn't go to your school counselor and answer questions like, so uh, what are you passionate about? You know, what do you imagine yourself doing in 10 years? Anybody, do they still do that? I mean, did, did anybody else do that? You sit down and they ask, what, are you gonna, what do you imagine yourself doing in 10 years? What's your gifting? Or, or you take a test that says you're a type A or you're an otter, or some kind of animal, and based on your personality, here's some careers that might be good for you, right? They, they didn't do that. In first century Israel, Israel, the question was, 
Did you pass school? And if not, what's your dad do? <laughs> That's what you'll do. If dad was a fisherman, you went to school for half the day, and then the other half of the day you went home and you worked learning to be a fisherman, learning the, the tools of the trade. And okay, so and this is, the reason they did that is because at any point in these three years that they're in the Beth Midrash, the Torah teacher could pat you on the head and say, bless your heart. That's if they were a southern Torah teacher, right? <laughs> bless your heart. You're, such, you're a sweet guy, really. I mean, you've really, I can tell you've really tried. But you know what? You're just not cut out for this. You know what, you know what you'd be good at? Your, your dad's a good fisherman, and I think you'd be a good fisherman too. So why don't you go on home and don't worry about coming back tomorrow or ever. Just You're going to be a fisherman. You're not smart enough. You, you can't go on any further. You don't have what it takes. Find a wife, settle down, and learn the family trade. Okay, so and most, most did not make it. Most were not, most would not make it. They were dismissed or they'd quit. Only a very few, select amount, like one in several thousand, made it through their age 15 education. If they did, the next thing they would apply for is something called the Beth Talmud. The Beth Talmud where they studied with a master rabbi, and the Jewish term for a master rabbi would be shmiha. I know it looks like shmika, but it's shmiha, okay? It, a master rabbi, a shmiha, is somebody who could interpret the text and give new understanding of it, okay? All other rabbis could only teach what had already been widely accepted. But a shmiha, if you, if you graduate, if you learned the Old Testament, if you were one of this, like, 1% graduate class, you could find a shmiha, a rabbi with authority, someone who's recognized as a teacher who can give new interpretation of the scriptures, and you would, you would ask to follow him, okay? And a actually, Jesus, in our, in our scripture, uh, wherever shmiha is used, it just says rabbi with authority, and Jesus, over and over again, amazes the people because not only do they sense that that he has an ability to interpret the Scripture in a new and enlightening way that's true and good for our lives, but there is something even different and beyond about him. And so you'll see these phrases where the crowds were amazed because he taught with authority. That's that idea of shmiha. Okay? Now, what does, that have, what does all that have to do with us in 2017 in Tennessee? Let me, let me make it a little more practical. Think about, think about sports in America. Okay? And, and for the, the sake of just my own understanding, I'll use basketball, because I played basketball in high school. When you're young, your parents, they, they toss an orange ball to you, right? And they, they see if you have any kind of coordination, proficiency at dribbling while walking at the same time. You enroll, and then, then if, you know, if it looks like maybe they've got a chance to develop some co coordination, or maybe just initially you just want to give them something fun to do and see how they develop, whatever, you enroll them in some kind of league, and if, if through the years they continue to demonstrate proficiency, then maybe they'll try out for the middle school team. Maybe, maybe they, you, you're watching them, and they're like, well, they can do this well, they're really terrible at this, but maybe with the middle school coach and a little more playing time, they'll continue to develop. And if they do that, well, then they might, you might encourage them to go out for the freshman team, and then the JV team, and ultimately, of all those that play basketball through middle school or to JV, a select few of those make varsity teams. And of all those who make varsity teams, this is true, only 3% play Division I college basketball. Division I, okay? So just, it doesn't mean, I'm not saying college basketball, but 3% play at really what would be the next level, Division I college basketball. And of all those, of all those, so think of Division I college basketball as kind of like the uh, Beth Midrash, okay? You've, they, they have, they, they're in the Beth Midrash, and they are the most promising students in all of that. And of all those who play Division I college basketball, 1%, 1% go pro, 1% make it in the NBA or the WNBA. 1%. So only 1% of all Jewish students are going to go all the way through the Beth Midrash and graduate and be able to train to become a rabbi of some kind. 1%. Most people in our context, somewhere along the line, we realized and admitted, I'm not a pro. Huh. I'm not a pro. My parents, if 
could probably tell you some very hilarious stories about my confidence in my basketball ability. But at some point, I had to recognize I'm probably not even a semi-pro. I'm good relative to my context here in my hometown, but I'm not that good. And we, we realize maybe I'm more of the person who goes to the Bridgestone Arena or whatever and watches other people put on a show with their gifts as opposed to me personally going one-on-one -on -one with MJ, Kobe, or LeBron, right? So to be a rabbi with authority, you know, if 1% are rabbis, then to be a rabbi with authority is superstar level. We're talking of the elite of the elite. And so those who graduate the Beth Midrash go out and they find one of these shmihas. And at age 15, they take a series of tests. And if they pass, and the, then they go out and, and they try to convince that shmiha to draft them. You know, they're putting on tryouts. Can I follow you for the next 15 years? Can I follow you for the next 15 years? To do what? So in North America, we think of, I mean, if you were to think of this as like a graduate school, we think of ourselves as students or learners, right? There's a different term that, the, that, that they're thinking about, because in North America, we're, we, when we talk about a student, we're talking about somebody who wants to know what the teacher knows. You want to know what the teacher knows. You, they, they, you recognize, hey, these people, they have info that I don't have, and I want to know that info for various reasons, to, to pass a test, to get to the next level class, to attain a career, to network, to develop knowledge that I can then use how I need to for my dream, my goal, my passion. But when a graduate of the Beth Midrash, when a Talmud student goes out and she, seeks a shmiha, he's wanting to be something else. He's wanting to be something called a disciple. And a disciple wants to be what the teacher is. This is on your notes if you're following along there on the back. A disciple wants to be what the teacher is. So they go to these teachers and they say, you have info that I want to learn, but that's a small part of a much larger goal that I have. See, I, I want to be like you. I want to be a reflection of you. I want to be a mirror image like when people see me, they see you. They see your teaching. They see the way that you live your life. You, they see the way that you apply the Scriptures in me. They'd say, oh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, you know, me and my brothers, depending on who you're with, when, they, when people meet me. When I was, when I was uh, in high school, people would say to David and Michael, oh, you're Stephen's brother, Right? Now, and my brother's played in an internationally famous rock band, and he's a missionary, and he's networked all over the world, so pretty much now I'm David's brother. I've been demoted to underneath my younger brother. I'm David's brother. So that's how, in our family, me and Michael are introduced as David's brothers a lot of the time. So anyway, I'm not bitter about it. It's just a fact of life. That's what it would mean to be a mirror image of your teacher, to be a disciple. Oh, you're so-and-so's disciple. You're not trying to do your own thing. You're trying to be and do what they, your teacher, are being and doing. A student says, hey, you've learned some things, and I, re I acknowledge that, I respect that, I honor that. You've written some things down, and I want to hear what you have to say. I want to read what you've written down. I, I might even memorize it, internalize it, but I'm going to take all that, and I'm going to use it for what I want to do, how I want to do it. A disciple is obsessed with and consumed by the desire to be like their teacher. I want to be you. I'll let go of any and everything. Remember, it's a 15-year commitment to be like you. And so with that in mind, we're going to look at the exact same verses we looked at last week, and we're going to continue this conversation about discipleship. John 1, 37 to 39. And it says, when the two disciples heard him say this, John the Baptist say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. So this is Andrew and John, probably the first two disciples to follow Jesus. The only debate is maybe Peter, maybe Jesus called Peter before. It's hard to tell uh, because the gospel accounts order the calling in different orders. We're not for sure. It was either Peter or it was Andrew and John, the first disciples that Jesus called personally 
Okay? Now, what I want you to notice in the Scripture, though, is they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And the word there is Shmiha. Shmiha. Teacher of authority, where are you staying? What direction are you headed? Where do you live? What are you doing with your life? And Jesus' reply is not, and this is the really important part, Jesus' reply is not, come and I'll teach you some great stuff. It's not, hey, I've written this book, it's kind of long, but it's really important, everything in it's really good, and, and I want you to read it. Not all at once, but how about like 15 minutes a day before coffee and breakfast? Sit under a tree, spend 15 minutes reading what I taught you, and then once a week we'll get together in a special building and we'll sing some songs together and we'll get amped up about special causes right before I give you 45 minutes of really intense teaching. And then we'll call that discipleship. That's not in there, right? He says, no. He says, come and, come and see. Come and be with me. Live with me. Watch me. Then you'll see what it means to be my disciple. And that's what these guys are looking for. And that's what Jesus calls them to. They're saying, hey, we don't want to just listen to you. That term, shmiha, where are you staying? Where are you going? What would, what's your yoke? That's something we'll talk about later in the teaching. But every rabbi, shmiha, has a yoke, and that's what they teach. That's what marks their teaching. What's your yoke? Tell us so that we might follow you. And he says, he doesn't give them any of that. He says, just come and see. Come and be with me. Come and be with you. We don't, we don't want to just listen to you. We don't want to just read the Bible. We've memorized big chunks of it, or at least we've tried to, and it didn't really change my life. But what we want is to be with you so I can see you and watch you and do whatever you do and be whatever you are. I want to breathe the air you breathe. I want to eat the food you eat. I want to walk in your shoes. They're saying, I have info. I have book knowledge. But now I want to know where you're going. And he says, why don't you come and see? Why don't you watch what it would actually be like to be like me. So, if this moment establishes what it means to be Jesus' disciple, does disciple describe you? Does disciple describe you? And, and I put a little verse up here, Jeremiah 20, verse 9, the second half of it. God's word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Are you consumed by, are you obsessed with the idea of going after Jesus? That's what Jeremiah says here. Does that describe you? I'm consumed with Jesus. I'm consumed by Jesus. My whole world is about knowing Him, being with Him, being like Him. So much so that if someone tried to keep me from Him, or if I tried to hold Him inside, I could not even if I wanted to. It's, it's spilling out of me. It's a fire seeking oxygen, and I cannot contain it. Even a small breath of what I desire would ignite not only me, but everyone around me with the same fire. I'm bursting at the seams to be with Jesus. If the definition of disciples is about everything I am and everything I am doing, being just like everything that Jesus would do and be in any and every situation, if the definition of a disciple is that you've spent so much time with him, I can't, you, you just can't help but to reflect and follow and imitate and every day become more like him, does that describe you? A disciple is someone who has let go of every dream, every plan, every job, every goal to have the one thing that they just have to have, and that is to be where Jesus is at and become like him. Now listen, you can be a student, you can be a believer. You can put all your hope and trust in Jesus. You can be saved and going to heaven. You can be forgiven. God's working in your life. But the question that Jesus is asking us today and always is, will you follow me? Are you my disciple? Will you come and see who I am and what I'm about and allow me to change everything in your life? Not just save you from your sin and send you to heaven, but will you follow me? And ultimately... Ultimately, that'll be the final question. That'll be the final question. And some of you are you're struggling right now. Like, don't you have to be a disciple to be saved? Well, to that I'd ask you, when did the disciples get saved? They believed in Jesus before they were disciples. They messed up over... We can have that conversation later. I think we get fixated a little too much on dates and times. And relationships just don't work that way. 
Like there is a day that Casey and I got married, but if you were, try, if you were to try and measure our love by dates and times, you would be sorely mistaken on what love is, right? You could capture me in a certain time and a certain date and be sure that I don't love my wife, right? And if you're judging me, I know you're there too, so... If I were to freeze frame a singular moment, it might not reflect your love. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. You can talk to me later if you're struggling with that. Are you a disciple? Sometimes I'm not a disciple. And what I mean by that is Jesus chose 12 who would watch his life most closely. I mean, he had somewhere around 70 to 100 disciples, people that wanted to follow him. We know that because he sent them out to go do his yoke. But he picked 12 who would follow him most closely. They, they would go everywhere he went. And, and among those 12, there were three who saw literally everything he did and heard everything that he taught and prayed. And those 12 were the ones who would say, I want to do that. I'll go there. We'll try this. 11 of those 12 made it. Right? 11 of those 12 made it. One of them was more of a student and a believer than he was a disciple. He wanted to take everything Jesus taught and did. He believed he was the Messiah, right? But he wanted to take everything Jesus taught and did and everything that Jesus was and use it for what he wanted to do. A, a disciple, Luke 9.23, says, if Jesus says, a disciple is anyone who would come after me, who would follow me, that person would also deny himself and take up a cross like the one I take up. And he would do that daily to follow me. It's a daily moment-by-moment moment choice to be a disciple. And sometimes I'm not a disciple. I'm more of an arguer. Anybody else like that? I'm more of an arguer. Like when I hear from God in the Bible or through prayer, I argue. <laughs> He's clear as day, and my response is, oh, really, that's, that's what you do in this situation? And it, you want me to do that? Hmm. Well, and then the argument starts. Have you thought about this? And what about that? What if this happens? And have you ever tried this? You're welcome for that insight, by the way, God. The argument happens. Are you sure? Could you, uh, could you get some fleeces wet for me? So I can be sure that's what you're telling me to do? That's a reference to Gideon. You can look it up later. Sometimes I'm not a disciple. Sometimes I'm more of an arguer. Here's the thing is I'm a believer. I believe Jesus is my only hope. He's the only way to heaven. I put all my trust in him to, make, to save me from my sin. I know for sure that if I died right now, I'm going to heaven. And I, I can even say, and I'm not saying this to brag, but I'm following Jesus in really big parts of my life. I've made huge sacrifices to follow him. But I'm not yet totally consumed with Jesus. And if you were to watch the disciples, as we will, if you were to watch their lives unfold, you'll see that in the Gospels too. So this is not condemnation, but it's a question, because this is what Jesus is calling you to, to be a disciple, to be obsessed with him, to be consumed with him. The disciples left everything to be with Jesus, not just a couple hours on Sunday and maybe a bonus hour on Wednesday or Sunday night with some Bible reading mixed in, maybe, to be, but they left to be with him 24-7 for the next 15 years, I mean, they thought, of their lives. To be like him, they had to be available to go wherever he went, and they had no idea where that might leave, but they left it all, and they said, we're with you wherever, no turning back. They didn't always do that, but they, made, they first made a decision, okay? They, all the disciples said, we won't run when they come and get you, when they arrest you, and they all ran, Right? But they made a decision. We're going to follow you wherever. So it starts with a decision. And we'll talk about what compelled them, but first, I've got a couple of sidebars. I kind of do that, don't I? Sidebars. All right, so parenting, first of all. This is the first sidebar. Parenting is the most important discipleship role we experience in our human lives. Parenting, and I'd also add grandparenting to that is the most important discipleship role we can experience in our human lives, both being discipled by and discipling our kids and grandkids, being discipled by our parents and grandparents and discipling our kids and grandparents. And here's, here's what it means to be a discipler as a parent or a grandparent. Parents, listen to this. Grandparents, listen. Every day, you're teaching your kids or your grandkids one thing. 
be like me. Be like me. Every single day, that's what you're teaching them. You're discipling your children. It matters what you say, but not nearly as much. It matters infinitely more what they actually see you do. Come and see. Seeing is believing. Seeing is about this is what it really looks like in my life. In spite of what I said, in spite of what I told you I believed or told you what you ought to do, what I do matters much, much more. What I do is the greatest indicator of who I am and what I am or or who and what I'm trying to be like. So when our children watch us, the lesson is always be like me. You may not want that. You may say, no, I want want them to be better than me. (laughs) That scares me. You may not want them to learn everything about you, to which I can only say, too bad. (laughs) This is reality. They will be like you. Your kids will be just like you. So then the question is, when you're teaching your kids to be like you, what are you teaching? What are they learning from you? What are they learning about your marriage? Like someday, I want you to treat her or treat him like I treat your mom or your dad. What are you teaching them about godly marriage? What what are they learning about keeping your promises? I told you I'd be there, but I wasn't. Be like me. What are you teaching them about purity? What are you teaching them about faith in the midst of struggle? When your circumstances aren't ideal, when you're too busy, when you're worn out, what are you teaching them? about what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because no matter what you tell them, what they're internalizing is what you're doing. You're telling them what you really believe and what's really important to you by what you do, not what you say. So what are you teaching your kids and does it look anything like what Jesus said is a better way or what Jesus wants us to become? If the answer to any of that is no... And listen, you know, you're a great parent in a lot of ways, but there are parts of your life you you know are not all in with Jesus. So if the answer to any of that is no, what needs to change? And not what needs to change about your belief system. You believe the right things. You believe in Jesus. You go to church some, and you read your Bible and pray together once in a while. It's not your belief system, but it's in the way that you live it out. It's the way you live out what you say you believe. And li- I'm not throwing stones, because if I throw one, there's a good chance it's going to ricochet off something and hit me. Okay? I- I'm not saying you're not a believer. I- I'm sure if you've put your trust in Jesus that you're saved and you're forgiven and you're going to heaven. I'm not saying that you're a bad parent. We all have good days and bad days. I'm not saying that you're a bad person. I'm just saying your kids will become like you, and if you want them to become like Jesus, what needs to change in your life? So that they will line up with what Jesus wants for them when he says, follow me. The second thing, the second little sidebar I have, and and so before I get there, I I just want to ask... our students and leaders that went to Nazarene Explosion to stand up real quick. Would you do that? I know, I know, I didn't, I only talked to one of you about this. Sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. Woo, yeah. So, real quick, I want to highlight something. Nazarene Explosion is an opportunity to go and and worship with a bunch of other teenagers and also to put, to use our gifts and talents with the understanding that it's all for the glory of God, okay? I want to highlight Haley McGregor over here did a whole bunch of art. Like, I don't know when you did all that art, if you crammed it all in in one night or over a couple weeks or what. But she finished third place on our district. So this is a district-wide event in pencil art, acrylic art, and then second in mixed media art, which is apparently to use any kind of creative medium that floats your boat. And you can mix it together and you can make a piece of art. I'm not artsy, can you tell? Um, She got second place in mixed media art on our district, and she got first place in pen and ink art on our district. This is going, yeah, this is going somewhere. 
Pierce back there in the back corner finished third in table tennis, to which I say I'd like to test my skills against you. I love table tennis. Let's play some time. Good job. And I saw, I saw pictures of this. Miss Julie played basketball and made, made the uh, regional team for basketball. So good job, Julie. Woo! Now here, here's, here's why I wanted to highlight that, OK? Because the second sidebar is that of, outside of our parents, the most influential rabbis in our world are those who invest in the lives of all kinds of young people in all kinds of contexts. And so Pam and Sandy and Cole and Callie, and, and thank you. you. You may not think about this, but you are showing people what it means to be like Jesus in the body of Christ. And there's many others. It's not limited to those four. There are many other people in this place. And let me tell you what I mean by this. I, I was a youth pastor for 10 years before I came here. I've had hundreds of kids come through my ministries. Here's the thing, is if you emailed and called all of them, asking them what they remembered about my teaching or what in my teaching impacted them or changed their lives, the truth is they would remember very little, if anything. And you might, well, yeah, they're kids. But how many of you remember even what I talked about last week if I didn't tell you at the beginning of service, right? Be honest. But I can tell you tons and tons of stories about students who have come to me and they've said, you know, we just love to be with your family. We, we love hanging out with you and Casey. You guys have such a strong marriage. We love seeing the way that you interact with Joel. I'm learning so much about being a parent. I want to be a parent like you someday. I want to be a husband like you someday. I want to be a wife like you, Casey, <laughs> someday. I could tell you tons of stories, scores of them. Kids, kids who said, I'm so glad that you came into my life, what you taught my dad about being a dad and the, how you have been kind of an extra dad in my life. Nothing that I've taught from my mouth really stuck with them. I keep up with them on social media, and many of them are carrying with them the values that Casey and I lived. And a couple of them are married now, and one of them even just had a baby boy. And it's so rewarding to watch them, knowing both the, these, this couple that had a baby boy, neither had the best examples of marriage and parenthood, but they're great spouses and they're good parents, and I didn't teach them that in my sermons. I lived it with them. I lived it with them. So what I do up here pales in comparison to what you all can do through the week with one another, with kids, with teens, with young adults, with young married couples, young moms who are floundering the same way that you did, trying to maintain friendships, maybe work a job, and raise their kids the way that Jesus wants them to be raised. It pales in comparison to what we do with our kids and teens here in this place. And if you're like, Oh boy, here comes the big recruiting drive, right? Yes, you're right. Because let me tell you, we do have spots open. We need another Sunday school teacher. We need four more people to work with kids on Sunday mornings. Just fifth Sunday, so it's like once a quarter. We need people for our nursery on Wednesday night. So we want to be a place for our community to be able to come and be discipled with one another in small groups or under, under teaching. But we don't even have nursery to offer parents of kids who maybe need it more than anybody else. They just need to be with some people that talk the same language they do, right? Can I get an amen, young moms? You just want to hang out with some adults and, and think about some things other than how am I going to get that poop stain out of my carpet and I hope they don't have any peanut-flavored candy in children's church, right? You'd like to think about something but I'm not just looking for a few spots to be filled. I see I need like a hundred people. You might say, Pastor, that's every person in the congregation. I know. I know. Because I don't just need more bodies. I need men and women who would partner with 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20-year-olds to show them what it looks like to live and say what we believe. And, and I would venture to guess that you're probably going to learn almost as much as you teach 
what that looks like is just going into, minist- going into a ministry or going to a person and saying, hey, listen, I'm not perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. In fact, I've made mistakes. Maybe you can learn from them. But I want to just know if you want to go get a Coke with me like once a month and talk about what Jesus is doing in our life. Just have some adult conversation and hang out. Let, let me bless you. Let me pay for it even. Because I'm trying to run after. I'm trying to follow Jesus. I'm becoming more and more obsessed with and consumed by becoming like him. And I was just wondering if you'd go with me. Maybe together we could spend time and go after Jesus together and become like him. See, I need as many people as possible to do that with our young people in our church. Look around you. There's there's young moms. There's young adults. There's there's teens and kids all over this building. And we're only growing in that respect. I need every one of us to take personal ownership to be rabbis, to be teachers, to walk together, to become like Jesus, to become like our shmiha. Okay, so why, why these sidebars? Let me circle back around. If the Bible matches the cultural reality of its time, you ready for this? The first disciples of Jesus were around 15 years old when Jesus called them. Did you know that? The first disciples of Jesus were around 15 years old. You don't, we don't usually picture them that way. Jesus recruited 12 high school freshmen and sophomores and three years later turned over the future of his movement to 11 high school senior boys. Lord have mercy. <laughs> right? If, if you're laughing or if your mind is blown because you didn't know that, it's because we look at people under 20, and especially now when it's so popular to rag on millennials, right? Please stop doing that. I'll tell you why later, but just stop. Because we look at people under 20, and people under 20 look at themselves in the mirror, and they say, I, I'm just a kid. I'm not ready for any of that, for this crazy stuff. But the reality is, if Jesus showed up right now, he's not coming to a big church and asking its staff to go with him. He's not going to a seminary of middle 20s and to 40-year-olds and asking them to follow him. He's not going to a high-rise office building and asking a bunch of high-powered businessmen to get behind his ministry. He's going down the road here to Avery Trace Middle School, and he's walking into the lunchroom, and he's saying, hey guys, I want to change the world, and I pick you. Who wants to go with me? Come and follow me. Come and watch what that would look like. I want to change the world. I pick you. Some scholars look at John, the guy who wrote the Gospel that we looked at today, And later in the book, he refers to himself as John the Beloved. Another way to translate that is John the Adolescent. Some scholars say that John was 10 or 11 years old when he left everything to follow Jesus. That exploding sound that you hear is how you've always read the Bible blowing up. Because Jesus is not walking around with an entourage of old, wise men with beards. Right? It's more like 30-year-old coach Jesus and a youth baseball team on a road trip passing gas and arguing over who is coach Jesus' favorite. The future of the church, everyone. It's never too late to follow Jesus. I'm not saying you have to be young to follow Jesus. But history shows us that every world movement starts with young people or is sustained and motivated by young people who get a fire burning inside them that they can't keep in. And this is equally, if not especially, true in the Bible. Joseph, 17 years old. Moses, high school age. Joshua and Caleb, kids. Ruth, a little girl whose husband just died and she has nobody to support her. Samuel, a boy, 10 years old maybe. God calls him to be the keeper of Israel. David, who his own dad forgot about in the lineup for picking a king because he was so young and inconsequential. Josiah, the eight-year-old king who brought holiness back to the kingdom of Israel. Esther, the teenage girl taken advantage of by the pagan king who goes and risks her life to save God's people. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, 
Most of the prophets were teens when God called them, going to a bunch of adults and telling them what they needed to do to walk with God. And the whole of the New Testament is about young people getting a fire inside that they couldn't contain. And I can't tell you, the reason that I had to talk about these sidebars is because I can't tell you how many times I've seen a young person catch fire, get excited about the church and following Jesus and all that it could be, and then an adult come along and pour a bucket of water on it. Parents who want their kids to be more balanced than just doing church stuff all the time. And adults who are more attached to their traditions than the vision and dreams that God's putting in his young people for the next generations. So it's important that we recognize discipleship starts with our young people. And it's important that if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, it means becoming consumed with and obsessed with and being, and being so fired up by that we have to pass it to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So what compelled these boys to make such an extreme decision to follow? And this is why it's important that you would go and pick a young person. Because normally if you were good enough and you graduated the Beth Midrash, you go and choose the rabbi that you want to be like. Kind of like picking a college. You're trying to find a good one that matches your interests, a yoke that you agree with, and that you're good enough for. They'll accept you in, right? Jesus was different. He came and picked who he thought could be like him. Look at John 15, 16. He says, you didn't choose me. He's talking to his disciples. But I chose you and appointed you for two reasons. So that you might go and bear fruit that will last. Peter, you're the rock on which I will build the church. And so that whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give you. I I've appointed you. I've chosen you so that my Father will listen to you the same way he listens to me. So that when my Father looks at you, he sees you. I want you to be like me. And I think you have what it takes to do it. None of these boys were good enough for anyone. Remember that. Someone had told them they weren't smart enough or religious enough or good enough to continue on in their education to be like God. Jesus came and said, no, you have exactly what it takes. Come and follow me. They were told to go work for their dads, and, some, and they all did, but they were all still looking too. We know that Andrew and John were hanging out with John the Baptist in their free time. They were looking for someone, something. There was something missing when they were told they weren't good enough. And Jesus comes along and says, you didn't miss anything. You're just who I need. Come follow me. Matthew was looking for a cause and he went and rebelled and collected taxes for the empire. Jesus says, you're good enough for my cause. Simon and Judas, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot were, re were, were rebels of the Israelite nation who wanted to overthrow the empire. They were all looking for a cause. They'd been told they weren't good enough to follow Jesus to become like God. Jesus says, I pick you. He picked them before they were ready because if we waited until we were ready to be like Jesus, we'd never find or follow Him. We'd never believe that it's possible for ourselves. But according to God's Word, Jesus picks us. It, this, I found this on Google Images while I was putting my PowerPoint together. It's a marketing thing. It's part of John 15, 16, and then it wants you to put your church name down there on the bottom. So let me just say, Cookville Nazarene Church, you have been chosen and appointed to go and bear fruit. And it starts by a bunch of people saying, I'm going to try and be like Jesus. I'm going to follow after Him. I'm going to be obsessed with and consumed by And I'm going to take somebody with me. I'm going to go and tell a young person, hey, I, I'm not, I don't even feel cut out for this either. But Jesus picks you and me, and maybe together we can do this. You've been chosen. Fill in your own name there. Chosen and appointed to go and bear fruit and so that the Father will hear what you, whatever you ask in His name and He'll do it. It's like Michael Jordan pulling up to the playground in a limo and saying to 7th grade kid, I see myself in you. And, and I think with me as your coach, I think you could, just be, you could be just like me. I want you to be on my team. You, you want to come and see what I'm talking about? You want to be on that team? There's a Jewish rabbinical teaching that says the worst sin is to teach people to believe in God and not teach that God believes in you. When we throw a bucket of water on a teenager who's catching fire, when we hold on to our traditions at the expense of dreams and visions, what we teach is that you need to believe in God the right way, my way. Not that God believes in you, that He's calling you, that He's putting a fire in your soul and He's filling you with, with, with the Holy Spirit and raising you up to do something that my generation didn't do. Remember that the Moses generation got to the edge of the promised land, but God raised up the young people, the Joshua generation, and they went in and took hold of it. Sometimes we get stuck in our old ways. 
We adults, we throw buckets on dreams and visions because they scare us. And I'm just as guilty as the next person. And this is not, when I first heard this rabbinical teaching, I thought, that's kind of humanistic, man-centered, God believes in you, woo. But it's not, that, it's not that God believes in anything that you've done or that you could do on your own. It's that God believes in Himself. He believes in what He can do in and through you. With, with Christ living in you, all things are possible. Totally unintentional. My boy's favorite song is the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. <laughs> totally unintentional. It was so awesome to read a Bible story in the story Bible with them the other night, and they started singing that song. I said, so I told him, I said, this, this, the lesson of this story, what it says right here, is that you can do the same things that Jesus did. And they're singing the same power. God believes in what He can do in and through you. All things are possible through Christ living in you. He'll give you what you need to believe in God and become like Him. So if the takeaway from last week is no matter the circumstances, stick with Jesus because He is who He says He is, then the takeaway this week is that it's worth it to stick with Jesus because He's calling you to something better than the lesser, common, everyday plans to follow Him and see what only He can do in and through you. He's daring you to come and see. Jesus is who He says He is, and He wants you to follow Him to a better life. So young people in this room, listen to me. God is calling you to let go of your ordinary, follow what everyone else in your class is doing lives, and follow Jesus. Wherever it leads, it won't be boring. That, that was one of the biggest hang-ups for me as a teenager. Well, I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that. It's going to be boring. But I was so worried about what I was missing out on that I wasn't focusing on what Jesus was calling me to. I missed an opportunity to change the world, that little world at East High School in Sioux City, Iowa. God wants to use you right now where you're at. He's not waiting for you to get older, to get more mature, to get wiser, to get smarter. God is putting a fire in your soul and He wants you. Pierce, Haley, Julie, Caleb. This whole front row. Young people. He's calling you. In fact, I would say this. If, if Jesus' life is a point of reference, if you're past the age of 15 and you're still waiting for that someday when God wants to use you, you're running a little behind. God has already called you. He's already given you everything you need to be what He wants you to be. And He just wants you to come and see. He just wants you to follow Him. Moms, dads, the second thing, grandparents, there are some of you that were under conviction and you are under conviction about how you've been leading your kids. Jesus is calling you to intentionally disciple your kids and some things need to change. And that's all I'm going to say about that because that's convicting enough on its own and you need to work out with God what that is. It's not my place to tell you. Lastly, God is calling people all over this church to serve in kids' ministry, to reach out to young people and mentor them. You don't go to them and say, hey, can I be your mentor? I'd like to tell you how to live your life. You go to them and you say, hey, could I buy you a meal? Could I give you an hour of sanity over lunch on Thursday? And then do it together. God's, God's calling people to volunteer at the rescue mission to not just go once a quarter on Sunday night, but to go and find people and work with Ryan to mentor people there. God's calling people to trust Him financially and become more generous for all kinds of reasons, for, partner, for our partners in Cookville. It, he's calling us to look into foster care and adoption and crisis mentoring as a church. Not just give money, but to actually go and do things to become like our Savior, Jesus Christ. To open our home for developing friendships with neighbors and church members. I had this really romantic idea of, of like loving on my neighborhood, and it turns out everybody in my neighborhood is not very friendly. Like You try and wave at them, I almost backed into a guy today, no joke, tried to wave at him, he didn't, he wasn't even, he didn't even look at me, tried to say I'm sorry, I was like, I'm sorry, waving, didn't even look at me, I had, but, but somehow, some way, I'm going to minister to my neighborhood, I don't know how, it's going to take some work, apparently, a lot more work than I thought it would be, I had this, uh, pastor moves into the neighborhood and the whole world has changed, right, it's not happening, but I know that God has put me there for a reason, so I'm going to keep trying, To develop relationships with people that you sit with on Sunday morning, but you never say a word to otherwise, other than, hi, how are you? Is your week okay? See you later. We're a part of the same body. God's calling you to get obsessed with and consumed by becoming like Him with the person sitting next to you and behind you and across from you. 
to participate in student ministry, and, and as we continue to talk to Northeast Elementary and eventually Avery Trace, to participate in school partnership. Not just give money, but to read books and spend time with at the community center. I just met a guy named Neil Markham. And you're like, Pastor, it's one thing after another. I know, I got another opportunity for you as soon as I finish this message. Because Jesus is calling us to be like Him. And He always had time for this person and that person and that person. He wants us to be like Him so that the world would change. If we're praying for peace for our veterans and for the countries all over the world, the way it's going to come is when some people start being like Jesus and loving where they're at and spending all of their time all caught up in His character and His way and His life. And some of you are sitting in your seat and nobody's better at quenching the fire of these calls than ourselves. And you're saying, you don't know my story. And I could, I could never. You don't know what I've done. I'm, I'm too old. I'm too young. I have a disability. I'm an addict. I'm a sinner. I tried before and it didn't work. There's not, a, not enough time in my life. I'm too busy. I don't have the gifts. I don't have the resources. I can't work with those kind of people. I don't think I could ever change. I don't believe I could ever do something like that. I'm afraid of what God wants me to do. I don't think God can use me. Did I cover it? Everybody in this room covered now? It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters what God believes and whether or not you believe in Him. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. And He picks you to bring His kingdom to, to earth. We're not waiting for heaven. We're bringing it here. Follow Him. That's why we decide to follow Him. No turning back because He chose you and He will equip you. Not because you can do it on your own. You can't. But Jesus picks you to follow Him. He won't do it without you. Well, He will. He'll pick the person next to you if you won't go. But He won't do it without us. That's always been His way. He invites us. So will you follow Him? No turning back. Some of you are going to need to pray about this at lunch. And this afternoon, you're going to need to pray about it all week long. Do not leave here without thinking, am I a disciple? By the definition that Jesus gives, ask yourself that question. And don't feel guilty and weigh yourself down with shame. And, and, and don't let the excuses and the fears and the lies of the enemy trick you into thinking you can't do it. Stand in the light. Let your eyes adjust. And when they do, you'll see that Jesus has picked you and He will lead you and equip you. Follow Him. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we can't do any of this on our own, and yet you came into this world and you equipped us and empowered us and gave us everything we need to go and do it and be like you. So Lord, we ask that you give us faith, not just to believe that you save us from our sin, that you're the one way to heaven, but you're also calling us to be just like you, to go and seek and save the lost, to introduce them to the living Christ and to take on your character and your way. Forgive us for complacency, for arguing, for second-guessing, for not believing everything that we say about You. And set us free to live a life consumed with and obsessed with You. In Jesus' name, Amen.